2 Timothy 3, and we read through 2 Timothy 4, verse 4. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. From this sort are they which creep into houses, who capture silly weapons laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, led of corrupt minds, <coughs> reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished of all good works. And now the next four verses will be the text for the sermon this afternoon. Chapter 4, 1 through I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they eat to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. This is the reading of the inspired word of God. May God bless this reading unto our hearts. As noted in the text in verses 1 through 4 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 3 reveal to us, verse 16, that all scripture is inspired. Not only that, but exactly because of inspiration, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And all scripture is purposeful, having as its purpose that the man of God be furnished unto all good works. Therefore, says the apostle, now in chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee, therefore, 
You could put, put aside now the rest of what follows in verse 1. We'll come back to that. I charge thee, therefore, verse 2, preach the word. There's a connection between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. And that connection is made plain by the word therefore in chapter 4, verse 1. That connection is very important. We must note the connection because the historic orthodox reform teaching of the necessity of membership in a true church of Jesus Christ has been diminished, minimized, and even attacked. There are many today who do not believe that they must become a member of a true church of Jesus Christ as instituted in the world. Some might say, well, I belong to the church invisible, that spiritual body of Jesus. Therefore, I, don't, I do not need to be a member of a local congregation. Others might say, well... I study the Word of God, I read the Scriptures, and I learn from God that way. I don't need preaching. Or we gather in our house every Sunday afternoon, and the oldest male member reads the Bible and explains something of it to us. And that, that's our practice. We do house church. Others might say, we used to go to church, but... We were fed up with the apostasy in our church and quite frankly, grew weary of church. We don't go to church anymore. And some will say, nowhere does the Bible teach that one is obligated to be a member of a local congregation. And so it goes today, there are many who are comfortable and at ease outside of Zion, outside of the church where Jesus Christ is, where the preaching is, where the sacraments are, where discipline is, and where the fellowship of believers is to be found through the Holy Spirit. I say again, note well the connection between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. What do we do with the God-breathed scriptures of verses 16 and 17? Of course, we read them and study them and memorize them and teach them, but... The Apostle says, especially this, I charge thee therefore, preach them, preach the word. It's not enough to read the word, it's not enough to study the word, but the word must be preached. I charge thee, preach the word. If there must be preaching, then there must certainly be a congregation to hear the preaching. What was God intending by that command? Preach the word. Merely that Timothy mount the pulpit every Sunday and preach. Or that Timothy mount the pulpit every Sunday and preach. And that there be those people there in Ephesus gathered to hear the preaching. What good is the preaching and the command to preach if there is no one who must come to hear the preaching? Preach the word. That's an obligation to preach and to hear that preaching. Because the mere reading of the God-breathed, profitable, and purposeful scriptures is not sufficient, God will have his word preached. And he will have a people who hear that preached word. Let's consider for a few moments this afternoon that command of chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. The main word in the text is preach the word. So let's take that as our theme, preach the word. Notice the command itself. Second, the urgency of it. And third, our obedience to it. Verse 2, preach the word. Well, what's that? What is the word? The word... is the canon of scripture, the 66 inspired books. Certainly, the word is the Old Testament scriptures when this word was written, but the Spirit has given to us also the New Testament canon, the whole of the scripture. That's the word. Preach the Bible. But more precisely, the word is not a thing. 
the Word is someone. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you go down to verse 14 in chapter 1 and read that the Word was made manifest, the Word was revealed, and the Word became flesh. And that clearly indicates that the Word is Jesus Christ. So the preaching of the Word is the preaching of the Bible as it reveals the crucified, resurrected, and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Preach Christ. Or as we commonly say, preach the gospel. The gospel is the word as it reveals the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. That's the word. If there is no cross, there is no word. Do not simply preach a word, but the apostle says preach the word. That is Jesus Christ crucified. Not your own words, Timothy. Not your own ideas. Do not preach man's words, man's philosophies, man's books, man's discoveries, man's research, and man's archaeological finds, but preach the word. Exclusively the word. Not the word and, not the word plus, not the word in addition to, but preach the word, says the apostle. Even when the Reformed Church obeys the established, nearly 400-year-old rule of the Synod of Dort and preaches the Heidelberg Catechism, as she ought to do if she is a Reformed Church, she is preaching the Word. And everyone ought to be able to see that the explanation of the Heidelberg Catechism is the explanation of God's Word. And even when the catechism is preached, everyone ought to be able to go home and say, we heard God's word. Preach the word. Preach it. Now that doesn't simply mean stand up and deliver a message, even if it's religious and has moral application. It certainly doesn't mean, as the senior patriarch of the family gathers some people on Sunday and talk about the Bible. That's not preaching. Preach the word does not mean project the word on a big screen with lots of stimulating, catchy images. Preach the word does not mean orchestrate a production where a man dresses up in a robe and comes on stage carrying a wood timber in the shape of a cross. Preach the word does not mean <coughs> gather together all kinds of bands and choruses and instruments and have a free-for-all where everyone is bringing their own word through all of their instruments. That's not preaching. This is what you must do with the word, says the apostle. Preach it. That word is literally herald. Herald the word. And that means two things. Number one, preaching must be the public proclamation with the mouth. That's preaching. That's what a herald does. To preach is to proclaim widely and broadly to all with the mouth to blast the trumpet as it were. But more significantly and in the second place, preaching is to proclaim officially and authoritatively as the very voice of Jesus Christ. Not every trumpeter of a message is a preacher. And not every man who stands on the street corner with his megaphone is a preacher. A preacher is a herald. Now in the, in the Bible times, there were heralds. A herald was the man who came into the palace at the word of the king. The king would take the herald and say, this is my message that I'm giving to you, and I want you to take this message now and go out in the surrounding countryside and bring it to all of the people in all of the cities. So the herald would go forth into the cities and say, thus saith the king, and all of the people would hear that word and say, that's the very word of the king, because that herald stood in the place of the king. He spoke the word of the king, and that's preaching. Preaching is official and authoritative. It's the very word of Jesus Christ. A preacher is a herald sent out by Jesus Christ, proclaiming the word of Christ. Romans 10, verse 14, and how shall they hear without a preacher? How are you going to hear the word if you don't have a preacher? 
at verse 50, Romans 10, verse 50, and how shall they preach except they be sent? How are you going to preach unless you've been sent by Jesus Christ? How does Jesus Christ send preachers? Does he come during the night and give a vision and say, I want you to be a preacher, now go out and preach the gospel. That's not how Jesus Christ sends preachers. The Bible teaches that he sends them through the church. The church commissions men to go out and preach the gospel. And thus Acts 13 verses 3 and 4 record how Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the church at Antioch. Preach the word. That means as an official, authoritative representative of Jesus Christ, called by the church, publicly proclaim the word of Jesus Christ crucified with the tongue. Preach the word. Now the inspired apostle will expand on that command in verse 2 and fill out the concept here. What does it mean to preach the word? He continues in verse 2, the instant, in season, out of season. That first of all, Preach the word means be instant, in season and out of season. There's no such thing as preaching season. There's hunting season. That's when the hunter goes out with his firearm or his bow and arrow and he's able to shoot deer or whatever is allowed. And then there is a time where it is not hunting season. You may not start shooting animals that way. There's farming season. That's the time of the year when the farmer can go out and till the land and plant the crops and later harvest them. And then there's a time where it's not farming season. It's the dead of winter. You can't farm. There's in hunting season, out of hunting season. In farming season, out of farming season. From the point of view of the preacher, there is no such thing as preaching season. It's always preaching season. The apostle says be instant in season and out of season. That is, be active, be busy, be engaged in the work, in duty, in season and out of season. At all times, Jesus Christ may be preached. Always preach Christ. But there are seasons for individuals and congregations. There's in season. This is a very lovely season. This is when there's opportunity to preach, and the congregation, the members of the congregation, the people are receptive to the word. They want the word. They thirst for the word. And the word has an influence and an impact upon their life, and it bears fruit. That's in season. But there's also out of season. That's when the people are not agreeable to the word, and they don't want the word, and they reject and refuse the word, and the word does not bring forth good fruits in the lives of the people. Paul says it doesn't matter if it's in season or out of season. Timothy, you preach the word. Be instant. And look at the example I gave you from my own life. Every time I went into a city, first I would go to the Jewish synagogue, and I would preach the word, and it was out of season. They would reject me and turn me away ordinarily. And then I would go to the Gentiles, and it would be in season, and they would receive the word, and they would bring forth much fruit from the word, whether out of season or in season. I preached the word. I was instant. And that's the calling for you, Timothy, and that's the calling for every preacher and the whole church. In season and out of season, be instant. Preach the gospel. Second, reprove. This belongs to faithful biblical preaching. Reproof. Reproof means to expose and bring to light. The word has to go where, where we by nature don't want it to go, where it touches us. The word has to go right into our marriage, right into our home life, right into our automobile, right into our computer room, right into our school, right into the consistory room. It has to go right into our heart, right into our hearts on vacation. Always the word has to go into our heart and bring out and expose our sins. That's what the word reproof means. Now there will not be universal acceptance of this kind of preaching. 
The old man of sin does not like to have those dirty works dragged out and exposed. But how are we going to receive the balm of Gilead, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, if our sins are not, first of all, exposed? Reprove, says the apostle. If preaching does not reprove, it's not faithful preaching. Preach the word, that means reprove. Third, rebuke. Now that takes it to the next step. Reprove is set it under the light, set it right here on the table. Expose it. Reprove. Rebuke takes it another step. Rebuke now is look at that sin and condemn it. Chide. Admonish. It's not enough simply to expose the sin and then say, well, that's not so bad, you know. Everybody's been doing that, or you can't help that. That's just the way it is, or, or someone else made you do it. That's not how we treat sin. The apostle says, we for you. And that means call sin, sin, and demand repentance. And that's exactly what Peter did on Pentecost. He said, you killed Christ. You took out the sin and laid it there. You killed Jesus Christ. You murdered him. Repent. Repent. Reprove. Rebuke. Now that doesn't feel good to anyone. But it's necessary unto the reception of the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation. We need our sins reproved and rebuked. If preaching does not rebuke, it's not preaching. Rebuke. <laughs> Fourth and finally, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Exhort, of course, means to give commands, repent, believe, do this, exhort. But exhort with long suffering. The apostles given a number of commands to Timothy, I think, for example, of 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lust. There's a command. Timothy's going to come to the pulpit with all the passion of the Holy Spirit. He's going to preach the word, flee youthful lust and lay that upon the hearts of the congregation. And it may happen that in the next week or the weeks following, he sees manifestations of people actually fulfilling their sinful lusts and might come, become disheartened. He might become bitter. He might become angry with God. The apostle says, exhort, but with long suffering. Be patient. If there's deliberate defiance and continued impenitence of course, discipline. But in the life of the church where there are attempts at obedience and some are stumbling and falling, look at your own self before God, Timothy, and how often you stumble and fall. Exhort with long suffering and doctrine and doctrine. That's not popular today. Doctrine. People do not want doctrine. The apostle says exhort with doctrine. What good is an exhortation to do this or do that if you do not first have the foundational doctrine of what God has done in Jesus Christ? What good is the imperative if you do not first have the indicative? This is what God has done. Here's the doctrine. Go ye therefore and do this. The exhortation arises out of the doctrine. So the apostle says, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That now is the Bible's explanation in this text of what is faithful biblical preaching. Preach the word. And that includes the instant, in season and out of season, reproving, beauty and exhorting all long suffering and doctrine. This command is urgent. <clears throat> the urgency is expressed in verse 1, I charge thee therefore. I charge thee. To charge is to place a weighty and solemn responsibility on, upon someone to do something. The apostle comes to Timothy and says, I charge thee. Preach the word. 
I charge thee before God. I call God down as my witness, and now here stands God with me, and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall appear, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. The Lord Jesus Christ before whom every preacher of the gospel will have to stand and give an account of that which he preached. The Lord Jesus Christ before whom every man will stand at the last day. He will be the judge and every man will stand before him. This judge, the Lord Jesus Christ now, the Apostle Paul calls as his witness, as it were. So here's the triune God. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ who's the judge who's going to come and appear and judge one day. Now here am I. I charge thee, says the Apostle. And that personal pronoun is emphatic. This is not Luke. This is not Silas. This is Paul, Timothy's spiritual father, his seminary professor, as it were. That one who labored so diligently and faithfully for the sake of the gospel, willing even to give his own life. Right now as he writes this epistle, he's in prison in Rome, ready to die, as the verses after the text make plain. The time of departure is at hand. This man now stands and says to Timothy, here's God, the triune God. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to judge all men. And here am I. And now this triumvirate, this trio, all of us say to you, preach the word. Preach the word. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word. This command is urgent. If you were to read 2 Timothy, the entire epistle, you will find all kinds of commands. You will not find another command that is introduced with a charge. This is the only command, the most urgent command in the whole book is this one, introduced by a charge. I charge thee, preach the word. That indicates the urgency. By the way, it could be it could be uh, explained and demonstrated that the Reformed faith has always recognized the urgency of this command. That's true, for example, in the Protestant Reformed churches and in our own denominational seminary. The whole seminary curriculum is structured around and is produced with a view to preaching. Everything centers on preaching. When a man graduates from seminary and gets a call, he will become, he will be installed or ordained into office. And his first duty, according to the call letter, is preach twice on the Lord's Day. This coming Wednesday, Pastor-elect Geichelar will be examined by Classes West. He received a call letter from Randolph PRC, and he accepted that call. The very first duty on that call letter is preaching twice on the Lord's Day. Then he will be ordained into the gospel ministry, perhaps next Sunday or the Sunday thereafter, I'm not sure. But in the form for the ordination of ministers, this will be the first duty listed faithfully explaining to their flock the word of the Lord. And then during the first year of his ministry, the church visitor, visitors are going to come and conduct visitation and judge the health of the congregation. And they're going to sit down with all of the office bearers, elders and deacons, and they're going to ask the very first question in the book, is the word administered at least twice on the Lord's day? Then there's the church order, which outlines proper church government, and the first 20 articles treat the office of the ministry of the word in the Reformed churches. Preaching of the word is first and primary. Why, then, is it so urgent? There are two reasons. Number one, preaching is urgent because it is the power of God unto salvation doesn't matter what happens in the world. It doesn't matter what circumstances change in the modern world. Preaching is God's power unto salvation. Romans 1, 15 and 16. 
Paul says, so much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 10, verses 13 and 14. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 17, so that faith, saving faith, so that faith cometh by by what? So that faith cometh by reading so that faith cometh by hearing, hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Preaching is God's power unto salvation. That's the urgency of preaching. Now that salvation is referred to in the text, in the phrase at the end of verse 1, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, and at his kingdom. That salvation, being a member of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, living in his kingdom, and performing all of the works of his kingdom, and belonging to him who's the king of the kingdom, that salvation, being in Jesus' kingdom, what opens the doors to the kingdom? Every reformed man knows that. Lord's Day 31. The preaching of the gospel opens the doors of the kingdom and closes the doors of the kingdom. When the gospel declares unto you, you have the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, the door of the kingdom is open. Preaching is urgent because it is the power of God unto salvation, the opening of the kingdom, kingdom's doors. Now in the second place, the urgency of preaching is the presence of apostasy. Apostasy. In verses 3 and 4, the apostle gives one of the clearest descriptions of apostasy that one will find in the scripture. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto faithless. Apostasy is the deliberate turning away from the truth. Sometimes the Bible puts the blame on false teachers. In this text, Bible puts the blame on the people for apostasy. For the time will come when they will, when they will not endure sound doctrine. Isn't that our day? The time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Sound, healthy, life-giving, orthodox, credo doctrine. People will not endure sound doctrine. You do not have to suppose that the church world today does not endure sound doctrine because the church world today tells us that they do not endure sound doctrine. The church herself says, we do not want doctrine. Will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, after their own carnal lust for all of the pleasures of the world, that's what's in the heart of those apostatizing, their carnal lust. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, their carnal sinful lust, shall they keep to themselves teachers. Now we'll come back to that phrase in just a moment, having itching ears. The phrase having itching ears does not describe the teachers 
but it is describing the people who do not want sound doctrine. They have itching ears. This describes the superficiality of so many people. They're not concerned about their heart, but they're concerned about their little ears, and they want teachers who will come and tickle their ears, tell them what they want to hear. Tickle us. Tell us a good moral story. Have a man come on stage in his casual apparel and sit down on a four-legged stool and just talk to us the way we talk to each other around a fire and let him tickle our ears. Tell us that we must do something to be saved. That faith without works is dead, which is true, but then teach that you must do something to be saved. Tell us that. Tell us we have to go into the middle of the city and make pancakes for the poor. And that's how you get into the kingdom of heaven. Warm our hearts by telling us that God has a love for all men and desires to save all men. Tell us especially this, that Jesus is pleading and begging and inviting and wishing and hoping and knocking and waiting and seeking and wooing me and my will and obedience and heart because that tickles my ear. The time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own carnal lust, they will look for those who will tickle their ear and then heap up these teachers. And that's what happens in the church world today. The church gets a new pastor, and the new pastor comes in, and he's got all kinds of flair and sensationalism, and the people get exactly what they want. He tickles their ear. There's no doctrine there. He's tickling them. But it only takes a year or so, and they're fed up with him. So they take him out the side door and throw him on the pile. They get a new minister. The new guy comes in with all his flair and all of his excitement, tickling the ears. And they get sick of him, so they heap him up on the, on the pile outside. And this goes on and on and on. As the apostle says, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And now he continues in verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. In some sense, in some way, the truth was there. And they turned away from it. They don't want the truth. But they turn unto fables. Let me give you one example. They turn their ears away from the truth and turn unto fables. Here's the truth. This is the truth that according to verse 15 of chapter 3, even a child knows. Because a child knows the Holy Scriptures, the basic teaching of the Scriptures. Here's the truth. God created the entire universe in six literal, successive, 24-hour days governed by evening and morning. That's the truth. The fable of evolutionism, the fable of theistic evolution, the fable of the framework hypothesis, the fable of the gap theory, exactly as the apostle warned they shall turn away from the truth and unto fables. Why is preaching so urgent? Apostasy. Timothy, preach the word while you still have believers in the congregation willing to hear the word. You cannot guarantee that will always be the case. Preach. Preach the word because it's the only way to Thwart this apostasy and preserve the church in truth. Preach the word because of the presence of apostasy. That's the great urgency for the church. Apostasy makes the preaching of the word necessary. Preach the word. This is a command. All commands it must be obedience. Everyone here must obey the command 
preach the word. Every one. That command comes, first of all, of course, to the minister of the gospel. With all of its weight, the command comes to the minister, and God says, you preach the word. Obey that command, minister. This command comes to the elders, all of the elders, the office bearers in the church. As God will say to every minister, what did you preach? God will say to every elder, what did you allow to pass for preaching in the church over which I made you an overseer? The primary work, one of the primary works of the elders is to see to it that the preaching ministry in the church is proper, preserved, protected, and provided for. And thank God for such elders in whole Protestant Reformed Church. Preach the word. They obey. Furthermore, this command comes to every member of the congregation. And it does not mean get up behind the pulpit on Sunday and preach. Nevertheless, this command must be obeyed. If there is no preaching in your church, then you must speak. And if reformation does not take place, you must leave. If there is preaching in your church, but it is not the preaching of the word, then you are obligated to speak. If no reformation takes place, you are obligated to leave. If in apostasy the preaching deteriorates, the members may not say that they are not responsible because they don't do the preaching, nor are they the elders who oversee the preaching. They are responsible for the preaching that takes place in their congregation, for the church preaches, and the church obeys this command by supporting faithful preaching and by seeing to it that each member attends a church where there is faithful preaching. Preach the word. Why do we obey this? How do we obey this? It's obviously no power in ourselves. Paul preached, Timothy preached. There were so many false teachers. There were so many who didn't preach. The explanation for why this command is obeyed is not to be found in man. It is to be found in God, in his almighty grace. By the grace of God, and only by his grace, we preach the word. If it were not for the grace of God, there we would also go. The God of this text and the Lord Jesus Christ of this text not only come, as it were, to stand alongside of the Apostle Paul and say, preach the word. But God comes through the Lord Jesus Christ and supplies the grace so that Paul and Timothy and the congregation there in Ephesus and every true church today is able to preach the word by God's grace, the church preaches. May God preserve this preaching among us for our salvation and the salvation of our children until that Lord of the text 